Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast Extra, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast and the Tough Girl Podcast Extra is sponsorship and ad-free, and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast, please do go and check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. The reason I'm able to produce these Tough Girl Extra episodes, this is due to the support of 252 women and men around the world who are supporting me financially whether that's $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, $25 a month. It really does add up and make a massive difference. So instead of me having to spend my time washing dishes in a local cafe trying to earn funds, I can actually spend my time researching these incredible women, interviewing these incredible women and editing these podcasts and sharing them with you. If you are enjoying the content and it is changing your life, then please sign up as a patron. Go and visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. Today, I'm so excited that we're going to be catching up with Paula Reed. Tribe, I'm absolutely delighted that we are catching up with Paula Reed. We had Paula back on the podcast. I mean, it feels like it was only yesterday, but it was actually the 11th of April in 2017. And you shared more about your life as an adventurer and ticking things off your bucket list. But Paula, for those of you who maybe haven't heard the previous episode, would you just like to introduce yourself and tell me just a little bit more about you? Yeah, sure. Um, I I believe in living life to the full. So, so my philosophy is that um, we only live once. I hope it's more, but that's what I'm running with. Um, one life and to live it to the full. So one of the ways I, I try and pack my life full of adventure and challenge and seize the day and savour the moment is to have a, a sort of bucket list, which I call my living life to the full list. So I've done 118 things on my live life to the full list. And I guess the two biggies um, that stand out are I skied full distance from the coast of Antarctica to the South Pole four years ago, which took um, 46 days and was a mammoth expedition. And then the other big one was um, I took part in the Global Challenge Round the World Yacht Race, which um, took 10 months. So they're the two big ones. But generally, I really try and pack my life full of rich experiences, be they challenging or funny or stupid or just fun or all sorts. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. And you became the 14th international woman and the third British woman to ski across the the Antarctic, from the coast of Antarctica to the South Pole, which is absolutely amazing. We actually talked about uh, that in a lot more detail in, in the last episode. But what, what's what been going on with you since sort of, you know, the beginning of 2017? And I know you went back to university and you've got married. So, so much good stuff has been happening. But do you just want to, yeah, take us back to what's been going on in 2017? Yeah, I'm very aware that, um, you know, we quite often talk about adventuring and and getting married and and doing a degree at uni were both adventures in their own ways. Um, Obviously not get outside and climb mountain type adventuring, but they're both kind of uh, challenging, (laughs) challenging journeys, not so much challenging the wedding, but, you know, they're big experiences. So since we last spoke, Sarah, I've been really going along with my challenge, which is 50 good turns, which is cycling across 50 countries with 50 people and doing 50 good turns en route. So I've done 12 countries now, um, which is great, but I did expect to have done more by now. But then the wedding and especially the master's degree, I did a part-time MSc in positive psychology. um, And that really obviously took up a load of my time. And then the other big news really is that my my now husband, Alex, who I married well, about five weeks ago, um, he took part in a mammoth um, challenge himself. So um, he kind of did a tough boy challenge, which was an attempt to sail solo nonstop around the world. And that was just massive. And I put everything aside to support him. Um, so that that took up a lot of my time, really, to just just to make sure he left in a safe and happy and healthy way. Um, so that that was huge as well since we last spoke. Oh, fantastic. Well, let, let's go into each one of those different areas because I think it will be absolutely fascinating to sort of dig down into, into the detail. So let's talk about the 50 Good Turns Challenge, 50 European countries, 50 people, 50 charities. You've done 12 countries. Tell us about the countries that you've done, the, the people that you've been involved with and the, and the good turns that you've um, completed. 
I'm loving this one, Sarah, actually. It's, it's a made-up game. I almost picture it like a board game um, in that, you know, it's my rules for, for the way I'm doing this one. But I'm loving it because it involves so many good elements. It's it's genuinely adventurous because I have to plot and navigate the route through a country and you're very self-sufficient. So, so having to be self-responsible, self-sufficient, um, there's the physical challenge, of course, of cycling. I try and do 80 to 100 miles a day on a on a touring bike with with luggage, as, as it were. So it's it's lovely, and then you get to see all these different culturally interesting countries. So I've done the UK, which was beautiful, and then I've done Poland, which was fascinating as far as the lifestyle out there, and then Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, which I've never done before, and this year I did Ireland, Hungary, and the country north of Hungary. <laughs> well, no, you're testing my geography now. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Slovakia? I think it was, yeah, Slovakia. That's bad. And, you know, so you get a, a an immersive slice of the culture and geography and people whilst keeping fit and whilst doing good turns. It's just brilliant. And I've been wild camping too. So I think for a lot of people... Um, wild camping is in, in itself a mini micro adventure and in itself has its own challenges and beauty and joy so I've also been wild camping on route too so it's combining all sorts of brilliant things and I'm loving this one and I've done 12 as I say so I've still got 38 to do. So tell us a little bit more about the good turns is this something that you plan in advance is this something that you're sort of waiting to see what comes up how does that aspect of it work? It's been a bit of both and it has been quite difficult because on the one hand, I'm this well-off, annoying woman who's who's coming from England to do a good turn. And I can be a bit of a pain in the backside to some charities because I'm not quite sure what day I'll turn up or what time I'll turn up or they have to accommodate me and, and try and find something that I can do for them. So in a way, it can be a bit of a pain if I'm not careful. And I certainly don't want to be you know, a liability to any charity that's doing all this amazing work. Um, so it's got to be something easy. So sometimes it's spontaneous where I might literally just um, go around a lake and pick up a load of rubbish all around it one day. So that's quite a, a good one or, or just generally picking up plastic or rubbish. One of my most enjoyable ones, though, was a contact through somebody I played hockey with. And that was in Belgium where there was a, a lovely farm where they helped um, a lot of um, mentally and physically disabled children generally look after the farm. And so I ended up painting a goat shed <laughs> with a load of kids and it was really enjoyable. And, and I felt like I'd actually done something decent for that one. So it's spontaneous or planned, but I really try and make it an easy ride for the for the recipient rather than me turning up and being a bit of a pain. Yeah. And what about the people that you're riding with? Because you wanted to sort of do it with, with more people. Are people applying to to ride with you? And who have you had join you on some of these different um, cycles across the countries? I've got loads of interest because I think part of the um, part of the appeal to other people is that they can sort of piggyback onto this adventure that I'm having and feel fairly confident and comfortable with me because I've done quite a lot of cycling already, but also have their own adventure. So um, I have cycled with one or two people who amazingly weren't great at cycling. Um, which So that was all about motivation and keeping them upright on the bike without falling off. And then I cycled across Poland with, with a guy called Newell, who I'd actually met when, when I skied to South Pole. So he was a very, very capable adventurer, expedition-type character. And we just absolutely nailed it and, you know, set up camp and very efficient and, and all that. So I've been cycling with all sorts, and I've got a list of... UCB, so unique unique cycling buddies that um, would all love to do countries with me. Oh, that's so fantastic! And what? How many countries have you got planned for twenty twenty? Are you thinking that for that far ahead, or have you got any more uh, planned before the end of the year? I haven't got any more for this year because it's just been a, a huge year. What with Alex being away so much, sailing around the world, getting married, and unfortunately also lost my father in June. So it's just been a bit of a surreal, weird year this year. So I'm kind of just quietly seeing the year out. Next year, however, I'll be really up for some big cycles. So um, the length of Italy is in my sights, and I think that'll be a good one. It should take about two weeks, I think. 
Well, that sounds incredible. I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your father as well. That must have just been horrendous to, to, to go through that. I'd love to talk to you as well about, about actually... I think it's really interesting being swapping positions. So you've, you, you know, you're an adventurer. You you live this jam packed full life and still do going off doing these challenges. And then it's almost been flipped where you're now in in the supporting role and having to provide that emotional support and um, uh, men- mental support, physical support, whatever uh, you know, support is needed. How was that for you? And especially maybe on like the dynamics of your of your relationship. Um, what do you mean with Alex, with his sailing or, or with the fact that he's... With Alex and his sailing. So, you know, he's getting prepared to go off on, on this big challenge and, you know, you're having to provide that uh, that level of support and encouragement and, and motivation. And just, you know, how, do, how was that sort of being in like a, uh, not being the one going off on an adventure, being the one sort of staying behind, but still having to provide all of that sort of support, which is needed? Yeah, it was interesting because on the one hand, I was quite frustrated and disappointed that it wasn't me going. And I think it's harder for the one left behind because you've got all the normal standard life still going on. um, And yet you've got this other half who's out there having an amazing, adventurous, challenging time. And every single person I bumped into for three months, the first thing they said to me was, how's Alex? How's Alex getting on? Which is like, hello, what about me? (laughs) So there was a sort of... Slightly frustrating, slightly selfish um, (laughs) feeling where I wish it had been me. However, you know, we're a partnership and I love him to pieces. So there was a lovely feeling of kind of intimate responsibility for him. Um, I felt honoured and and privileged, I suppose, to be his partner in this huge challenge and slightly responsible for his um, well-being during the trip. So... I actually got quite stressed while he was away because I was doubling up my work at home, being the only one left at home. I had a lot of actual work on and underlying that was a constant worry about him, plus supporting him every day, um, sometimes with technical issues that he, he needed help for. So there was all sorts going on. There was stress and worry and jealousy and privilege, I suppose. How did you deal with that that stress and that worry? I I'm not sure I dealt with it very well. I was very aware that I was stressed. You, I could just feel it. I was so tense around my neck and shoulders, and my eyes were just popping up my head. Um, I just most of the time I just cracked on, which which is one of my coping strategies, I suppose, just to just to keep pulling that extra resource out of me and crack on crack on I did actually force a holiday um while he was away because I just knew I needed a bit of sunshine and some rest and a break um so I went to the Azores for a week on my own um still working out there but change of scene really helped and did some cycling around there and had some fresh air so that helped and then of course I had friends and neighbors supporting me so the old social support was was good as well yeah I mean, it must be were you able then to to use that experience of um of being the one sort of left behind while Alex is off on you know doing his big challenge to reflect back on some of the previous journeys that you've done when you've you've left out family and friends behind when you've been off in you know Antarctica and, and in the South Pole um has it changed your perception of what it's what it's like when you're doing adventures but you're you're the one sort of supporting yeah I guess it's given me a bit more sort of sim- sympathy for especially my mum, she's the one I think that suffers the most. Um, Alex kind of get, gets it, as, you know, so he he understands and we understand each other, but it's given me a bit more sympathy. And I think it brought Alex and I closer together, interestingly, because although he was physically away, we were kind of psychologically so close to each other while he was away. So that was interesting that it kind of brought us together in a weird way. And then modern technology is quite interesting because we were – we were texting every day and then we had a satellite phone call every Sunday. So to actually stay in touch was also good and something we both looked forward to. So I think, um, you know, bearing all that in mind, a lot of my friends and family wouldn't want to be skiing across Antarctica and they're quite happy just living virtuously through me doing it. Um, but yeah, a bit more sympathy, I think, for, for those left behind. Yeah. How long was Alex away for in the end? He was away for three months and he left on Christmas Eve, which was difficult 
but then he had a bit of technical failure, so he managed to pull over before the start line, and then he left again on New Year's Eve. So all in all, my Christmas and my New Year were completely taken over by by Alex's fanfare and departure and press interviews and all that. So yeah, three months during the year that we were getting married. Oh my goodness, I'm thinking, oh, have Merry Christmas, off you go, <laughs> Happy New Year, off you go. <laughs> 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 happy valentine's while he's away at sea and oh yes we're getting married in three months time you better come back <laughs> he i think he's timed this particularly well hasn't he you know got, he's got out of christmas new year valentine's day left you to the planning of the wedding <laughs> no only messy only messy um, so let's i'd love to talk more about the the masters that you decided to go and do so t- tell us more about about your msc and how it came about where you decided to study if you did it full-time part-time and yeah I'd, I'd love to know more so um I've got to a point where I just felt like a, a big bit of learning I, I read books a lot and podcasts fantastic but I just felt like going on a training course of some sort and I didn't know what and I just googled loads and loads of stuff and this this degree in a positive psychology just kept popping up and almost you know magnetic attraction to me like do positive psychology uh, and it really suited me so I'd already felt the power of my mindset during past adventures particularly skiing to the South Pole I definitely felt a physical huge fluctuation in, in energy because of what was going on inside my head and how much my self-talk and narrative and and feelings affected my performance so I'd I'd actually experienced the psychology anyway and built up my own little toolbox of resources so actually doing the degree was fascinating because it added the science and the evidence and the models to what I'd already felt and experienced so I chose a master's it was an MSc in applied positive psychology and it was at the University of East London and I did it part-time over two years which was brilliant and I loved learning so much about motivation and optimism and hope and needs and human performance and Maslow's hierarchy and all that fascinating fascinating stuff and then I was a bit stuck about what to do for my dissertation and finally I suddenly thought yes I've definitely got this dissertation thing and I looked into the purpose and benefits of adventuring so it was perfect for me. So my my dissertation researched um, why adventurers adventure, basically. Oh my god, amazing! Was it was it even more specific than that? Was it focused on a, on a niche of adventurers or just adventurers in general? Well, I'm just about to get it published, and and to get a dissertation published in an academic journal, there's a lot more rigor and discipline involved. So since since the dissertation, I've had to tighten up on all the definitions, and I've specifically looked at. Um, extended period so a long period of time expeditionary adventurers so so basically people that have been away for at least a week most people I'd researched had been away for months doing these really long expedition style adventures like running across a country or cycling around the world or sailing around the world or skiing to the south pole that sort of thing uh, this I was like, this just sounds absolutely fascinating. I love this stuff because I, I went back to university to do my master's in women and gender studies and did my dissertation on women adventure and fear. Um, and so absolutely amazing. How, w- were you working at the same time that you were doing your, your master's? So were you still, you know, ha- did you have a normal job while you were studying? Well, I, I, I was working. I freelance and, and work for myself quite a lot. So it wasn't full time. Um, but I think the hardest thing, Sarah, and I don't know if you had this too, but it was just the headspace because your mind or your brain or your thinking is taken up with with logistics of work and preparing for work and being at work. But then you've got this almost mind-blowing, explosive content because some of the lectures or, or theories that I'd look at, I think either with philosophy or psychology, they kind of blow your mind. <laughs> And you can just feel this mini explosion going off in your head when you think, oh, my goodness, I've just realized X, Y and Z about the human race or what it means to be a human being or, or you know, physiological effects of, of belief. It's massive stuff and, it, and it's just fascinating. So, so I was working, but not full time. But I think my biggest challenge, if you like, was creating the headroom to be able to not just read and write, but to really think about the so what and the the impact of all the theory and 
how to get those insights out of all the research. Yeah. And this is what I'm going to say now is going to sound really stupid, but thinking is actually sometimes so hard, like, especially when you're trying to at, at like a master's level at the academic level. And I had, I mean, I hadn't studied since I was like 24 years old <laughs> and suddenly it was like full on back into academic texts and reading and you'd read like a paragraph and you'd just be like, exactly like you said, like mind blown. And then you need to like read more stuff. It was just a lot of reading and thinking. It's, um, it's, it's a huge amount of, of extra work, but even when you like love what you're, love what you're doing, but actually I suppose <laughs> you can also apply what you're learning there with regards to like resilience and determination and be, being flexible flexible and um, dealing with like this unknown work that you're actually learning so congratulations on getting it published into a book and are you are you also sort of turning it into like a, an aspect of business as well so the fascinating thing is Sarah that most people have heard of sports psychology it's a fairly existing established discipline and I would roughly describe sports psychology as um, helping for get um, peak performance, but in quite fixed conditions. Adventure psychology for me is enduring performance, you know, over time, but in uncertain and unknown and challenging conditions. Now, adventure psychology doesn't exist as a discipline, and I really think it should. So in my article, I propose that adventure psychology gets named and launched as a separate discipline alongside sports psychology, because all the sorts of things you talk about in this podcast, Sarah, the motivation and grit and determination and hope and optimism and human needs and, and personality traits and grit, you know, all that stuff. It it should sit under, I think, its own banner of adventure psychology so that everyone who studies it and talks about it and learns about it can sort of share best practice under the one umbrella. So I'm super excited to kind of at, try and launch it as a discipline, but then I'm also launching it as a business because I think there's a lot that we can all learn from the mindset of an adventurer, which is about exploration and discovery and courage and humility and grit and resilience and all that. So I've trademarked adventure psychology and the strap line is going knowingly into the unknown, which I really love. This is absolutely fascinating. And you know, what? the more you talk about it, the more I agree with you, actually, because a lot of a lot of adventurers will probably speak with like sports psychologists, um, you know, to do that, the their, to develop their mental mindset, their their mental resilience, especially, you know, if they're rowing oceans, or they're doing these big physical solo challenges, or, you, you know, cycling around the world, sailing around the world, like, uh, mentally making sure that they're in in that headspace. I, that's this is gonna this is the birth of something so so exciting. Um, what have, what's been like sort of the feedback that you're getting so far on it? Uh, everyone loves it. It it takes them seconds to get it, which is good, isn't it? Because they they do say you know any good idea you should be able to explain in ten seconds or whatever. So everyone gets it, especially when I compare it to sports psychology. And and then everyone gets super excited about it, like you've just done. It's like, oh, yeah, I really get it. I really see it. And it really applies. So in life and in business, really, it's all an adventure, isn't it? It's a long journey of uncertainty and challenge and ups and downs and good bits and tough bits and mountains to climb and valleys to cross and all that. It's, it, you know, And the word adventure itself, you've got the word advent, which means about to happen, as in advent calendar. And then venture, which is a sort of tough um, challenger, you know, that you're about to embark upon. So it's just about future challenge. And I do think life and business is is this journey of future challenge and uncertainty. And if we can borrow some of the mindset and tools and language that adventurers use, then I think we can spread the word a bit and help everyone to have the courage determination, humility sometimes, creativity to go and explore and to have a bit of confidence to to step out there, even if they don't know all the answers and they don't know exactly what's around the corner. So yeah, there's there's so much parallel if you compare an adventure with, with real life. So I'm really excited about it. I'm taking it mostly into businesses to help businesses and individuals thrive rather than just survive um, in future uncertainty and challenge. 
And actually, we probably need that more than ever now with the world, how it is with Brexit and Trump and what, yeah. what, you know, what's going yeah. on in the world. There is, yeah. a, there is a lot of un- uncertainty and it is, it, it is complex and it's, and it's a completely different world. Because even if you think about it, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't have things like YouTube and Twitter and Instagram and the social media world that's, that's exploded. And so I can't even imagine what the world's going to be like in 15 years time because things might not even have been invented by then so I mean during the course was there anything that you learned I mean there's probably lots of stuff that you learned that was really sort of um you know blew your mind I was like oh my god this is amazing but what were the practical things that you sort of were able to take away and think oh yes I can apply that to my future challenges or or actually I can use this when I when I'm supporting um Alex with his next challenge any sort of practical pieces of advice that you can give that maybe you know women listening can think oh yeah I could use that on my next challenge yeah there's there's a really simple one Sarah just thinking about the answer to that question um and that's just the concept of curiosity I think which could maybe time with you know the growth mindset where you're willing to be open to explore to not necessarily know all the answers and to feel tied down and worried about not knowing or failure but just to be curious. And if you're feeling fearful, so you you studied fear and women in your in your research, which I'd love to hear about one day too. But um, I think even when you're feeling fearful or anxious, if you can channel your mind towards being curious, curious about the rock that you've got your hand resting upon or the person that's shouting at you or Trump's <laughs> rhetoric, it, it does switch your state from being fearful and anxious to one of curiosity which is a calmer state and it's almost meditative so so that's one that I've taken away and I I rather like um and I've been using it a lot um since myself um so so there's there's quite a lot of talk nowadays about the um benefits of meditation or mindfulness and I think going on an adventure be that a walk or a mountain climb or a cycle I think helps with that sense of presence and it's almost mindfulness in itself where you're in a state of flow and um, you lose sense of time and you've got this curiosity of what you're exploring and looking at. So, so all that I think was, was a direct result of understanding the theory on the course and then translating it into real life. Yeah. Do you have like a a meditative practice or do you, do you do mindfulness, um, sort of daily is that part of your daily routine um I sometimes wonder whether it should be and my excuse is always I'm such an active person I'm active bodied and active mind and I do find it hard to just sit and meditate so I do do um I do do yoga physically but my form of meditation is more about um the curiosity but also the joy and pure sort of just pausing and in like enjoying nature so rather than just sitting and trying to have an empty mind for me I find it more easy to to just savor um beautiful moments so mostly I find nature um helps me a lot with that yeah. I mean, I've, I've also found, you know, sometimes when I was doing massive amounts of running, when I was training for the Marathon de Saabs, I would, I would, like you mentioned, like get into that state of flow and like the hours and the miles would just disappear. And then it would almost be like, I'd, I'd wake up and be like, whoa, how have I done like eight miles without it? And it felt like it'd gone in like, not, you know, like a second, but super, super quickly. And I've also had it a lot when I'm walking, when I go into such deep states of thinking that I'm just not, not necessarily like paying attention because I'm just just so in flow and I think that's almost like my form of meditation is by via exercise and I think a lot of people maybe don't go necessarily that deep but they get that stress relief for, from being active and being physical or even you know when you're rock climbing if you're having to you don't have time to think about what's going on outside because you're too busy either problem solving and thinking about where do I place my next hand where does my foot go what you know what's the next movement that I need to make so I do think they are just a form of meditation or mindfulness. I think because mindfulness has come from the Eastern philosophy, I think our Western view of it is sitting on a mat with cross-legged and just trying to empty your mind. But I do, I, I agree with you, Sarah. I do think that these physical flow experiences can also just be another version of mindfulness. It's just our version of it. 
<laughs> I mean, massive congratulations on, on going back to going back. I was going to say going back to school, but that sounds very American. But you know, <laughs> going back to university to do your masters. Did, did you graduate this year? No, I graduated last year. Fantastic. And I got a distinction, which knocked me over. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah, but super, super well, um, well deserved. And um, is when's the book come? Is sorry, is it a book or is it an academic? Is it going to be an academic article in a journal? That it, it's the latter. It's an academic article in a journal, and it's a journal for sports and exercise psychology. So that's great because that was the journal I was hoping to get into. It's just been accepted and it's available online, but I've literally just been editing it this this weekend. So I think they publish every two months. So it'll be due for publication, I should think, within the next two or three months. Oh, my God, that's going to be fantastic. Oh, I, can't wait. Oh, I hope I've still got access to my, um, oh, what's the word? My, uni- my <laughs> like, free, the, yeah, the free, free pass. Yeah, my free pass through university libraries or whatever to, to journals and, and stuff like that. that. Yeah. 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 So you're doing your 50 good turns. Uh, you've been focusing on that for the past couple of years. You've been supporting Alex with his big role in sort of, in 2018 you've been doing your MSc and that's been over so that was over 2017 and 2018 2019 getting married and sending Alex off and um, you know obviously sort of you know saying goodbye to to your dad as well what else is was the beginning of the year like what, what else have you been involved in well I've, de- I've been delivering uh, adventure psychology it, uh, the early stages of it it was a bit um, on the hoof so a bit like um, shoving some of it out there and seeing how it landed. But I did have quite a few business bookings to deliver it. So whether that was a whole company talk or a leadership workshop or a chief executive um, meeting, I was actually delivering quite a lot of adventure psychology as well, which was fascinating because when you get challenged and questioned by leaders of businesses, you're adding sort of lovely layers of perspective and reality to it. So so that was fun as well. So for the first six months of this year, I was delivering an awful lot of adventure psychology through different mediums. And Alex was an interesting one because um, Alex had to actually retire from his effort in March, which was an interesting situation because he'd already sailed halfway around the world. And he thought he had a tiny bit of damage to the mast but he couldn't quite see because the seas in the Southern Ocean are so you know, rough and steep that he couldn't physically climb up the mast on his own to double check. But the mainsail wasn't winching up very easily and wasn't coming down very easily. So that we had a fascinating few days where we were on the satellite phone overnight and I was trying to coach him to make a decision that he'd be happy with for the rest of his life as to whether to retire or not from this huge record attempt. So so that that was quite intense and that was in March and he did decide to retire and pull into Adelaide and I literally flew out for two days because that's all the spare time I had to see him in and obviously that was really emotional and interesting as well from, from a, almost an adventure psychology point of view as to how he made that decision and how he processed it. And the fact that he's actually quite comfortable with that now that he's home, that it was the right decision made for the right reasons. Um, and he's decided not to attempt the record again. So so that took up a lot of March and April generally, looking after him and him coming home and obviously processing all that. And can I just ask as well about, I mean, uh, it, that sounds as though it's putting you in a very difficult slash awkward position because you you know you love and, and care about him so much but then you're also like trying to coach him or you're not trying to coach him but trying to provide that support from that with that psychological background that must have been like I don't it, it's not sort of conflicting but it must have been a very challenging and very difficult situation uh, over those couple of days like h- how did you cope with that it was it was slightly conflicting because I had different, we both had kind of different hats on. One one of the hats I had on was obviously girlfriend, soon to be wife. So there was all the love and the care of him as a human being. But then if I had my adventure hat on, it's like, I understand what you're going through. I understand the conditions and, you know, safety comes first and all that. And then there's a tough girl element of me, Sarah, that that's kind of, you know, get on with it. <laughs> 
yeah. <laughs> so I had all the, I, I did have conflicting feelings about it all. And in the end, luckily, I went to a friend who happens to be a sailor and who happens to be a coach. And I said, look, I've got to, I can't tell Alex what to do because obviously that wouldn't then be his decision. So please, can you give me some coaching tools and tips that I can use on him to help him make the right decision? So that worked out really well because she was objective, but understood sailing and was a coach. And one of her top tips, which I love, is to live with each decision for as long as possible. So she said, if he can, make a decision as if it's real and live with it for 24 hours and see how it feels and how how it sits with him and check in with his emotions around it and then make the opposite decision and live with that for 24 hours and, you know, reflect on how that sits with him. And that was one of the piece of advice you gave. And I thought that was a good one when you're in a live situation and you're having to make a big decision um, to actually live with each decision for as long as you can. Um, so I was doing things like that for him. Did, did he do that? He did, but for quite a short period of time, because I think he was gradually already working towards the decision to retire. Um, so, but it was, it was tricky to get, get it right because on the one hand I wanted to be there and give him a good old hug and on the other hand I wanted to give give him kick up the backside and say just get on with it you know the whole world is watching you it's a record attempt it's going to be tough and then you've got the logistics of trying to work out what exactly has broken and and how much that's going to affect his speed because it was a record attempt and we were literally recording his you know, miles per hour, as it were, every day. So we had Excel spreadsheets galore recording his velocity versus the record. So there was there was all that going on as well. And then once he decided, there was a massive sort of panic to get him lined up to, to find somewhere he could pull into to find people that could help him sort out visas and passports and my flight tickets and insurance and all that. So so it went mad once the decision was made. But it was it was an interesting situation and in a way I think what would be great if if we both stood on a stage in front of people and we almost talked about his internal dialogue and my internal dialogue but and then actually what we said to each other because we all have these different stories in our heads depending on what we're thinking don't we yeah and there's there's so many levels as well like because sometimes there's not things that you can't say but you've got to be so careful about how you say it and what you're saying and especially with such a big massive decision and you don't want him turning around like four or five years later saying well you made me quit um you know quit the race I could have carried on but oh you know oh oh yeah drama 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 um right Paula we're going to mix things up a little bit now we're going to do or I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions now my questions may be quick but your answers don't necessarily have to be (laughs) okay okay are you ready Yes. Brilliant. Are you a morning or evening person? Evening. I could stay up all night and party. Oh, that's so interesting. What time do you go to bed? I would happily go to bed at one o'clock or two o'clock every night. Um, But Alex tends to start dropping off about 10. So we compromise about 11. (laughs) About 11. What time time do you wake up in the morning? Eek. I'm getting a bit naughty. About half past seven, eight o'clock. That's not naughty. I was expecting like half 10, 11 o'clock. That'll be a little <laughs> bit more naughty. Do you set an alarm or do you just wake up naturally? I try and wake up naturally. Um, we sleep with our curtains open. So I quite like natural light coming in. But then like yesterday, it was really dark. And I think I could have slept until midday because the weather had turned and it was all grey and miserable. <laughs> do you have like a morning routine that you do? No, my day is so different every day and work is varied and everything's varied. I do try, if I can, to go for a 10-mile cycle. So there's a 10-mile circuit that I do locally, which is like cardio exercise for 40 minutes a day. And I try and do that about 9 o'clock. So I've got up, I've woken up, I've had a cup of tea, the rush hour traffic's died down, and I'm still feeling bright-eyed with with the sun coming up and all that. So I try and do a a 10-mile cycle about 9 o'clock if I can. And would you still do it even if it's raining? Oh, yes. Yes. Very good. What book are you currently reading at the moment? Oh, I'm reading four. I'm probably reading about ten. They're all stacked up by my bed. But I've literally just bought four hardcore, tough girl type books all about survival and pain. So I've got two of them right in front of me. One's called Fear. Actually, I've remembered. And then I've got The Brave Athlete 
calm the F down and rise to the occasion. <laughs> and then I've got another one called What Doesn't Kill Us. I can't remember what the fourth one's called, but they're all about survival and endurance and pain and fear, which is um, fascinating me at the moment. Oh, I love it. And do you have a favourite movie that you like to watch? Well, ridiculously, again, I really love um, children's movies. So I'm a real kid. So things like Madagascar and Happy Feet are two of my favourite films and Frozen, of course. So <laughs> so I immerse myself like a child. I get all bright eyed with a little packet of you know, or sweeties, <laughs> and I, I cry at the those bits, and I laugh at you know all that total kid. Love it. What about music? Favorite favorite artist? Favorite genre? Favorite song? Well, the wedding was interesting. So so my walk down the aisle song um, was a thousand years by Christina Perry, and I love it. And it's about, I don't know if you know the song, Sarah, but my mum was like, why is it called Waiting for a Thousand Years? And I said, well, it's a song about the marriage between a vampire and a werewolf. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's like, oh, um, and it's from Twilight. So um, I love that one now. And it, it makes me slightly tearful each time I listen to it because of the experience that I had walking down the aisle on my own in a beautiful dress to that song. And then for the evening, I love really pumped like progressive trance, so something like insomnia, where you do the whole mosh pit, jumping up and down madly and wildly, getting all sweaty and super high. So that sort of pumped music as well. Oh, that's fantastic. And I've been meaning to ask you, you didn't exchange rings. Did you exchange sunglasses? Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we didn't want rings. I don't wear jewellery at all. I'm not keen on the feeling of metal anyway. So like money and knives and forks and stuff, I don't like touching. But I also generally don't wear any jewellery at all. I've got no rings, bracelets, rings or watches. So, and Alex didn't want to wear a ring. And also with our sailing and adventuring, we didn't want to wear rings. So somewhere in the paperwork, I'm sure it said, what do you want to do here? Are you exchanging rings? If not, what are you going to do? And... Um, <laughs> And we're famous for wearing sunglasses because, you know, he's a sailor and I'm outside a lot. And they're circular in shape because part of it is about the internal circle of life. So we exchanged sunglasses and the celebrant was brilliant. He completely, he just, he was so funny. He just like, uh, I've never done this before. <laughs> and the, and everyone at the at the ceremony were laughing their heads off and it worked really well. Oh, fantastic. Hey, do you know what? It's all about making it personal to you guys. And, and that's, that is what is so important. So I love that. Do you have um, a mantra or words that you try and live your life by? Yeah, I've got a few. Choose your attitude is my main one because it covers all bases, really. In, in that everything we do, we can choose our attitude towards it, especially when things get tough. I think if we can choose the more positive attitude, um, we can role model the way for everyone else as well. So it's not just affecting me and my positivity and my energy, but hopefully if we can choose a positive attitude, we can role model the way for other people to take their cue off as well. So choose your attitude is my main one, but I've got, I've got about 10 and I pick and choose them for situations. Um, pain is temporary. Pride is, is forever is another one that I like. So no matter how tough things get, the pride of achievement will stay with you forever. Yeah, I love that. What about food? What's your favourite type of food to eat in normal life and your favourite type of food when you're out on expeditions or challenges? So my treat food, when I'm ill or feeling sorry for myself or feeling like a treat, is a specific combination of smoked salmon, mashed potato and peas. <laughs> it's very specific. And a bit of gravelax. Um, I love smoked salmon. I love prawns and mash is comfort food. And then peas give you a bit of healthy green stuff. So that's my that's my go to treat meal for birthdays and special occasions. And then when I'm out and about, I'm really good at eating almost anything. So just before this phone call, Sarah, I had two week old apple and blackberry crumble in the fridge and I just ate it. So. <laughs> I love it. Do you cook? Uh, not very well. No, I, I try and get people drunk rather than feed them when they come for dinner so they don't notice <laughs> good tactic I see what you're doing there I see what you're doing there do you have a favorite piece of gear or kit apart from your sunglasses obviously <laughs> yeah I think my iPhone I know iPhone's everyone's favorite bit of kit these days but just 
for what it can do because the photo I love taking photos and you know when you when you're lying in the middle of the road to get that eye level view of a beetle crossing the road in the sunshine or something I think taking photos is part of the joy of traveling but also for navigation I am rubbish really rubbish at navigating I'm one of those people who's kind of left right north south dyslexic so heaven help me if I didn't have some form of navigational device so obviously an iPhone for that but currently because I'm touring all these countries I've done thousands of miles on my bike and it's an old English old-fashioned steel framed doors super galaxy touring bike but it's proving to be my trusty steed because I've given it hell and it's still holding me up. So uh, my bike currently is one of my favourite toys. And does your bike have a name? It does. Um, I've got two cats called Pete and Weed because they were born in a plant pot. My sledge when I skied to the South Pole was called Weed because it's, it was quite naughty like my cat. And my bike is called Pete because it's black. There's logic behind that. <laughs> Do you want to explain that? Pete, as in P-E-A-T, um, the bike's black and the cat is black. And the cat's called Pete because she was born in a plant pot. <laughs> and she's Petey. <laughs> got you, got you, got you, got you. So, Paula, where is the best place for people to find out more information about you, your living life to the full list, uh, more about adventure psychology? Where is the best place to go? So I've just um, updated the website. So there's there's still paularead.com as ever, which is more about me and my adventures and bucket list and all that. Everyone's welcome to dive in there. And that's Paula Reed, R-E-I-D. And then my new one is adventure-psychology.com, which is all about the new discipline of adventure psychology. There's also an interesting uh, conference in February called Adventure Mind, which is looking at the mental health of adventuring. So I'll be speaking at that too, and that should be a good one to inform policy and decision makers about how good it is for us to get outside and go on an adventure. That's with Explorers Connect, isn't it? Like Blinda, yes. Kirk's back. Yeah, that, to be fair, I saw that conference and it looked absolutely insane. I, I'm actually going to be away, so I won't be able to make it. But what I will do is I'll make sure that I put all the links to everything that we've talked about, links to your website, links to that conference as well in the show notes so that people can go find, you know, go and click on it. Um, will people, just out of interest, will people be able to read your article for free or not? Or is it only going to be through the, the through the journal's website or if, or if they go on your adventure? psychology home page would there be a link there there's a big push for having for free access to articles and research these days so we can all share knowledge however some journals do have rules and regulations and i've downloaded the rules and regulations for this journal but i haven't read them yet okay <laughs> so i'm hoping to make it public access um and i can certainly chunk it down onto my website so i just do need to double double check the rules of that particular publication fantastic no it's just I, I think it would just be absolutely fascinating um, fascinating to read to read um Paula thank you so much for coming on the tough girl podcast extra it's been incredible to catch up with what you've been up to congratulations on the distinction in your in your degree in your MSc in your in your masters massive congratulations on getting married and um best of luck with the remaining countries that you've got to go for 50 good turns it's going to be incredible again to follow along with that journey thank you sir it's been great to talk to you again Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Paula. What an absolute inspiration. And if you haven't done already, please do go back and take a listen to the first episode we did with Paula. I think they're just incredible episodes to listen to one after the other. It really shows you the journey that Paula's been on and, and what, she's, what she's been doing, what she's been achieving. All the information and everything that we've talked about today will be in the show notes. So please do go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com. If you're brand new to the podcast, I would encourage you to go and check out the website toughgirlchallenges.com because on the website, you can see details details of all of our previous guests. You can find more information out about me, the different challenges that I've done, the different books that I've written. Um, it's well worth spending some time just exploring that. 
There's now over 220, maybe 230 episodes of the Tough Girl podcast. There's also about 30 episodes of Tough Girl Extra. Um, A whole host of women, all ages, all sizes, all backgrounds, who've been doing a whole array of different challenges. Just want to share a couple of the episodes which are out in December. So on the 3rd of December, Veronica, we spoke with Veronica Bourbeau, who ran 3,010 kilometers in 72 days across Japan. Plus, she also shares more about her plans to run the length of Africa in 2024. We've also caught up with, or sorry, we've also spoken with Rachel Yassim, a 49 year old mother and full time adventurer who's currently cycling the world and living a nomadic lifestyle on her terms. On the 17th of December, we're going to be speaking with Emily Pennington, who shares more about hiking the Annapurna circuit in Nepal, backpacking the High Sierra Trail in California, and also trekking in Iceland. The 24th 24th of December, we're going to be catching up with Jasmine Muller, who's an ultra cyclist who shares more about breaking records, dealing with failure, and also saddle sores. We also do have, there's a lot, (laughs) I feel like apologizing, but I'm not going to apologize because there's so many incredible episodes coming out. I've been working so hard to, to catch up with previous guests of the Tough Girl podcast. So just an example of some of the Tough Girl extra episodes that we've got we've got you know we spoke we've caught up with joe bradshaw who shares more about her seven summits and going after it she's got two more summits to go we caught up with Lindsay cole the urban mermaid and you can hear how she rescued a cow from the thames when she was swimming the full length of the thames we catch up with anna blackwell who shares more with her latest expedition the green ribbon expedition we're going to have sarah utanon sarah utanon melissa yuri we're going to be catching up with shona mcpherson who's just recently completed the pacific crest trail um so much incredible content. So new episodes of the Tough Girl podcast coming out on a Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time and Tough Girl extra episodes come out on a Thursday at 7 a.m. UK time. So make sure you do hit that subscribe button. And like I said at the start, the reason I'm able to produce the Tough Girl extra episodes is purely due to the financial support I'm receiving every single month. I cannot tell you what a game changer, what a life changer is having a regular source of income coming in. So please do go check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. Donate what you can wherever you are whatever you are doing have an incredible day give it your all give it 110 percent get after it go for it believe in yourself because i believe in you all right take care lots of love and i'll speak to you soon bye